Don is actually uh, skilled uh, knowledgeable implementation project manager, trainer, and a business analyst for all areas of QAD. He's been an implementation manager for several large complex uh, QED projects and worked with the Genmark's QED system since 2007 in manufacturing system management, service support, and, and finance. Uh, Don has diversified background in a wide variety of manufacturing industries from medical, electronics, uh, to industrial consumer products. Has been spoken for many years in APEX conferences, QED Explore conferences, QED regional user group conferences, and he also taught ethics certification program at uh, California State University at Fullerton for over, over 20 years. So please welcome Doc. Thank you. I, I was going to say uh, it looks like uh, Mary Ann's got most of the uh, participants in the uh, Channel Island presentation, but uh, we'll suffer through with uh, MRP. So as uh, Alex said, I uh, taught uh, the APEX certification courses at Cal State Fullerton for about 20 years and some years, <clears throat> more than I'd like to think. And uh, so what I did is I put together uh, some MRP concepts, processes, and uh, we'll relate them to how QAD deals with uh, MRP. There's three basic objectives for uh, MRP. The first is that it's an attempt to ensure that material is available to make what you plan to produce in terms of material and uh, production. It uh, allows you, if you have the proper data in your uh, MRP uh, planning elements in 1.4.7, uh, to maintain the lowest possible inventory uh, when you run MRP and process inventory through the on-hand quantity. And then it, it also is a priority planning tool. It's not only a material scheduling tool, but it's a priority planning tool. So it allows you to plan manufacture activities to be able to calculate when you need to start work orders, when you need to place purchase orders. So those are the three primary goals, to have the right item in the right quantity at the right time. <clears throat> By the end of the session, hopefully, we'll understand how MRP relates to ERP. Does everybody understand the difference between ERP and MRP? ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning, that's basically QED and all of its uh, sub-functions. MRP is just that one little section that was invented by George Plossel and Ollie White back in the late 60s that does the explosion of the bill of material and gives you your plans. That's what we call it, the MRP process. Uh, we'll describe the MRP process, the inputs and the outputs. What do you have to have and what do you need to get out of it? Some basic methods for calculation of MRP. We'll go through the actual uh, MRP grid and look at how MRP calculates uh, instead of just looking at 2314 or 2317 we'll actually look at how it's uh, put together hopefully we'll understand how bills of material play in there it's not uh, a lot on bills but uh, bills are one of the primary inputs we'll understand lead time exposing offsets and then uh, the location of those data elements within the MRP uh, planning structure, either in 1.4.1, 1.4.7, 1.4.17. So we'll see where all of those are and how you can uh, then manipulate them. Uh, and how we're going to optimize those planning elements. What uh, kind of values do you need for EOQ? What do you need for minimum order quantity? What do you need for uh, lead times? Those kinds of things, so we'll see where they are and what we do with them. So in the uh, closed loop system, as the old Apex uh, flow chart says, we start up here with uh, business planning, feeds down into production planning, master scheduling, master scheduling feeds down into material requirements planning, and that's kind of where we're going to spend most of the day. And then uh, once the material plan is put together, you've got 
purchasing and your shop floor control, labor collection, 1620, 17.1, however you do that. So MRP sits over here in the, uh, the closed loop system. So it's one of the subsets of uh, the ERP process. It's built upon uh, demand, primarily parent component demand. And uh, we talk about independent demand. Independent demand is the demand that is placed upon an item that is at the randomness of the customer demand. It's called independent. Uh, it is MRP driven through what we call dependent demand. So the fact that these legs go into a table, the end goes into the table, sides, top, hardware kit, etc., those are dependent demand items and those are defined uh, on your bill of material system or if you use uh, formulas in 151, uh, you can drive it uh, that way also. So uh, these parent component relationships are what drives MRP. MRP is based upon a primary concept or principle and that is that you only want to look at what is out of phase with the plan. In other words, that which is wrong, not that which is right. Uh, in our ERP system, we've got about 8,000 parts. We've got about uh, probably 150,000 uh, records in the MRPD table. And so you don't want to be going through 150,000 records every week. So MRP works upon a principle of accession, so it's only going to show you what you need to take action on, not go through and review uh, everything in your database. Uh, inventory behavior. At the end item level, you can either use a reorder point system, which basically says you start off with a quantity, you deplete that quantity until you reach an ROP, a reorder point, and that launches an order to the planner that says, hey, you need to reorder that, that part. As far as uh, MRP is concerned, you've got the, pay, the same basic uh, flow, start off with a quantity, deplete, start off with a quantity. But <clears throat> in the uh, component level, this is where you get uh, messed up with the calculation or using a reorder point process on a component, you can see that on the component level, if you're, built, if you're basing it on a bill of material, you're only going to order there or there. And so if you look at the component, you have a quantity on hand, and the only place that you're, uh, in this case, you're not even going to get an order action message out of a reorder point uh, system. The same goes for raw material. Uh, in this case, you're not even going to get an order for uh, raw material. But with ERP, uh, MRP, the MRP system says that here is the reorder point or your order quantity or your safe stocker. We'll look at some of the ways that we can calculate that. You get an action message, and that action message then says order here, and based on lead time offset, quantity that the, or the value you've got in there for lead time, you're going to get a uh, demand for the raw material to order and come in, deplete, come in, deplete. So uh, the order point system doesn't work very well in a, in a bomb structured uh, environment. However, MRP allows you to do this explosion through uh, the bill of material. <clears throat> the MRP process uh, as we said, determines basically the three things. <clears throat> what is needed, how much is needed, and then when to order. And it involves four primary pieces of information. You have to have your lead times, your bills of material, inventory status, and uh, your planning data. MRP has a couple of inputs. First of all, the master schedule that is the schedule of the end items that you're going to make and ship to your uh, customer. And who does that? People do that. It also requires bills of material. Bills of material are how that 
parent component relationship is put together, people do that. Planning data. Planning data is in, as I mentioned, 1.4.7, 4.17, and that's your lead times, your order policies, your uh, uh, yields, those kinds of information. That also is people. And then finally, inventory status. Ben can tell us about inventory status because that's your quantity on hand, right? And who does that? Doesn't do it by itself. People do it. So I always get upset when people come to you and say they, the system doesn't work. It's the system. That doesn't work. No, it's not the system that doesn't work. It's the people that run the system. When Ollie White and George Plossel invented MRP back in the late 60s, it runs exactly the same as it did back in 1960. As a matter of fact, MRP in QED, MRP in SAP, MRP in Oracle, MRP in JD Edwards, MRP in e, uh, M4, it all works the same. If you know how ERP, MRP works, you know how MRP works in every single system. So it's product oriented. There it's based on uh, bomb relationships. It's forward looking. In other words, you're going to be taking this and you're going to be projecting out in the future when you need to have material available and at what point it's going to be scheduled. It's time phase because one of the elements of MRP as it was uh, developed back in uh, the 60s is this ability to represent time in uh, the computer system so that you can explode that bill material in a time phase mechanism so it takes into account uh, lead time. And it's, it's flexible because you can run MRP, there's 23.2, 23.3, debt change, regeneration, uh, selective MRP. You can run MRP five times a day if you want to. We run MRP at night, uh, 23.2 net change. We run 23.3, uh, uh, 23.3 is regen. Uh, we run regen every uh, week end in our batch system, and uh, it explodes. So it's, it's a very flexible system. You can uh, use it to do uh, your planning uh, as many times during the day as you want to. The prerequisites of MRP are, one, uh, number one, this independent demand uh, forecasting. Uh, don't have time to get into uh, forecasting, but uh, if you exponentially smooth your forecast or you use regression analysis or whatever, you load that into QED through 22.1 through the forecast maintenance uh, module, and that then determines the forecast that's going to be driving that uh, mass production schedule. Uh, the bills of material, quantity per, scrap factors, we'll uh, look at that. That's basically how your product goes together, and that's going to be defined in 13.5, your bill of material maintenance, 15.5 if you use formulas, and then uh, you can also, if you need to, use alternate bombs and alternate formulas in 13.1 or uh, 15.1. Then you've got uh, shop order data, because once you create the planned orders and you release those on to the shop floor, uh, activity is going to take place. You're going to, fans going to be issuing parts. You're going to be adding labor to it. Uh, you're going to be moving it through uh, the manufacturing process. So you're going to be doing 1611s, work order receipts. All of those things affect how MRP is going to net next time you run uh, one of those regeneration uh, explosions. So, uh, shop floor inventory records. This is your on hand and on order quantity. Uh, I sometimes get upset with my purchasing people because they don't pay enough attention to the due dates of the purchase orders that are going to come in, and that's going to affect how MRP renets your uh, planning data and what it's going to give you in terms of those new orders that are going to be placed. So the purchase order data needs to be kept up to date, allocations, lead times, due dates, all that, and you need a computer in here. I don't mean spreadsheets. Do not use spreadsheets to do MRP. I have planners who love Mr. Uh, Gates and his 
Excel spreadsheets and they don't trust or they don't understand how MRP works. And so therefore, they know how Excel works, especially if they grew up in accounting. So they create these planning spreadsheets that attempt to emulate the results of what ERP QED does with its MRP system. So put all the data in the computer, not in Excel spreadsheets. Uh, lead times are based upon your product structure. Here we've got uh, part number B, it's got a lead time in one week. B takes C and D. C takes two weeks to build. D takes one week to build. And then C is uh, composed of an E and an F, both taking one week to build. So you need to put that data into QED. And then <coughs> that calculates from the time the order is placed until the part is ready for use. That's the definition of that lead time. Exploding is this 23-2, uh, 23-3 uh, explosion that takes the data in MRP and recalculates this on hand, on order, demand process that gives us what our MRP order actions are. And then offsetting is basically the difference between the date that you need to place the order versus the date the order needs to be available to issue into the next level. And we represent that here with uh, the MRP system. Here you've got our bill material structure, okay? Uh, MRP is gonna be based on the product structure, the end item forecast and mass production schedule, and in some cases, you might even have a part that has both kinds of uh, demand, both dependent and independent demand. So that's going to be uh, driving into uh, MRP. If you turn it on its side, okay, we simply take that bill of material, turn it on its side. Now we've got our final assembly due here in week 16. It takes, what, two weeks to build it? So that means that you need to start the final assembly in week 14 in order for how to be coming into stock in week 16. And you simply take the due date because if you need some assembly B to start uh, final assembly on week 14, it's got to be in stock in week 14. And then you need to start that, its lead time, which is two weeks, back beyond that. So this is kind of hard to do in a spreadsheet, but MRP is uh, very effective that using its offset, and then the total amount of time, what we call the cumulative manufacturing lead time, is the amount of time that you are going to uh, have nothing on hand and then going to be able to produce an end product in totality into uh, inventory. This becomes uh, important in terms of forecasting because we're going to need to forecast, in this case, at least 16 periods in the future. And there is a cumulative manufacturing lead time calculator in QAD that calculates that for you. It displays it in 1.4.7, uh, 1.4.17, so that you know exactly how far out in the future you need to take it. So there's basically five steps in MRP. Gross, the net, the lot size, offset, and explode. That's all it is. It's an MRP dance. It does that time and again. You determine the gross requirements. You determine the available inventory, what you've got on hand. That's why cycle counting is so important. Then you calculate your net requirements. You calculate planned orders to go, uh, satisfy those net requirements. You offset by lead time, and then you write your action message. And this is by low-level code, by item, by time period. The low-level code is the lowest level that you will find any, or that particular part number in any bill of material in the system. So the low-level code tells the system that you can accumulate all of the gross requirements for that part and then go ahead and do the uh, calculation. If you look at it on a uh, logic flow, you start, Okay, explode the parents in the component, 
at that low level code, as I mentioned, low level code X, you summarize the planned orders and gross requirements by time period. Then you read the part number, you compare it to stock in on hand, and if in fact you've got it covered, then you go back and read another part number because you don't need to do anything. If it's uncovered, then you go down and plan orders for that part number. If all orders or parts are processed at this low level code, then you just go back and read another part. Otherwise, you ask, are all parts in this low level code processed? If they're not, go back, explode the components. If they are, you end. And so that's the basic logic flow of how MRP does this uh, explosion low level code by low level code. If we look at this explosion in terms of this netting and this time phasing, if I've got a gross requirement up here of uh, 100 for part number E at level zero, that means the gross requirements are 100. And now if I go down to component A1, I can see that the gross requirements for, or the net requirement for the parent becomes the gross requirements in component. You add the on hand and scheduled receipts. So we'll talk a little bit about scheduled receipts in a second. You then compare that, so you've got 27 available. Your net requirement of the component is now not 100 for A1 to make 100 E's. It's only 73. If you've got 70, a net requirement of 73, now you go down to B's, you've got a gross requirement, you go ahead and calculate the uh, total available, you subtract, you got 43 that you need to build B's in order to satisfy A's and E's, and then you go on and you go through that same netting calculation down to uh, the component level. So. That's how MRP goes through that logic flow to calculate the uh, time. This is the basic MRP grid, okay? The basic MRP grid is a statement of what this particular item is, what it's on hand, are they allocated, if it's got safety stock, uh, basically everything out of IM underscore mask, which is the inventory master, and out of BTP, DEET, or uh, BT Master. So these, this is the data regarding that particular part number. You then have time buckets, and this is where you are able to project out across the planning horizon, however many periods you've got in your uh, planning system based on that calculation of QMLT, human manufacturing lead time. And then you've got uh, that planning horizon. MRP is time phased and forward looking, as we said. The current time at the beginning of the first period is where your quantity on hand comes in and your allocations. As you move out across, an item is considered available in the beginning of the time bucket in which is required. So as you look at your time buckets in QAD's MRP 2314, your uh, system is telling you that this particular part is available at the beginning of the time period. A quantity shown as a projected available row is a projected available balance at the end of the uh, time period. And I'll show you what that means in terms of uh, the calculation of this projected quantity on hand. So if we look at this, here we got a part number item here we've got four weeks out across the planning horizon, and we've got a quantity on hand of 10 as the beginning quantity on hand. So at the end of the first period, we have no requirements. We've got 10 available, and so that projected available flows through to the end of period one. In period two, we have a scheduled receipt available that is planned to come in during that period. And at the end of period two, your projected quantity on hand is going to be 30. 30 none required in three. 
None required in four. So at the end of period four, we have still 30 available, and we have a uh, demand or gross requirement of 35 in that fifth period. So the projected quantity on hand says, if I've got a net requirement, I need to plan an order to uh, come in during that time period. So we've got a net requirement, we've got a planned order receipt in that period, and we offset it to its planned order release date. It plans to come in, and your projected quantity on hand then goes uh, from a negative 35 to a, a zero. So that's basically what uh, QED is doing at, for every single part number in your product structure. The computation of that projected quantity on hand and net requirement is that the quantity in hand in time period T is equal to the quantity on hand in time period T minus one, the words the period behind before it, plus a scheduled receipt in uh, period T is going to equal or is going to be subtracted from the gross requirements of period T, and that is going to be what that quantity on hand is going to be during that uh, time period. So GRT is gross requirements, the quantity on hand in T is the current, minus one is the previous, and SRT. So you can see how computers love this kind of stuff. This is, this is what computers are built to, is to use those uh, calculations. Subsequent net requirements uh, is equal to the difference between the successive negative values of on hand. So as we saw, we walked through and those 30 carried from one period to the other. That's how we calculate that. So let's look at a, a quick example of uh, an MRP process here. We got part number X, it takes one and two. It takes four time or four periods to build four of X. Uh, and these are the plans, so we're gonna Calculate planned orders for X. Y takes one and three, its lead time is six, and we have a master schedule of one, uh, oh, for part number one in periods one and two. So we got part number one, we've got a quantity on hand of 95 allocations, which you'll see we define as uncashed stock room receipts. The safety stock is 10. Lead time is three periods and lot size is 100. So if we uh, walk through that, you can see that here I've got 15. That becomes a requirement, a gross requirement, period one. In period two, we have 25 and another 15. We've got a 40 that comes from this planned order in nine for 40 units. It takes six weeks to build it, but it means it's going to have a gross requirement of the component in period three. In period four, we've got 30, 15 in five, then we've got another uh, 45 in period seven, which comes from these 15 and the uh, 30 in period 13 for wives. And so now we've accumulated uh, our gross requirements for that part. So that's the first step in uh, MRP. So now we're going to look at the projected quantity on hand. We start off with uh, 95. Our safety stock is 10. That means we've got uh, 85 available. We've got a, a demand at 15 in period one. That means at the end of period one, we have a gross or a projected quantity on hand of 60. In period two, we've got uh, 40. From the 60, means we've got 20 available. 40 plus 100 is 80. If we continue out across the horizon, 80 minus 30 is 50. 50 minus 15 is 35. 35 carries because we know no gross requirements. And now we've got a minus projected quantity on hand, or a negative uh, net requirement. That means we need to plan an order in that period, and the uh, Lot size is uh, 100 units. We're going to offset by the lead time. MRP assumes you're going to do what it says. I'll come back to that in just a second. And then uh, that leads to a projected quantity on hand in period nine. And so that would go down through that whole uh, netting process in MRP. So planned orders. What are planned orders? Planned order is the primary thing that MRP does. 
because it gives you planned orders. Planned orders exist only within the computer, and they're subject to the next change or execution of 23, 1, 2, or 3, the regeneration. There's four parameters for uh, a planned order. A planned order is equal to, or the required date of the planned order is equal to the first net requirement. So the first time we see a net requirement, it means the system's going to plan an order for it. Then lot sizing the planned order is based on the order policy in 1.4.7. So if you've got an EOQ or a lot for a lot or period or quantity or whatever, it's going to lot size based on that uh, value. And then the planned order release is equal to the order required date minus that lead time. That's that lead time setback that comes and tells you when you need to start that order. Planned order release of the parent becomes the gross requirement of the component. So, planned orders here, we'll look at a quick example. Planned order release of the parent becomes the gross requirement of the component, both in terms of date and quantity per. So if I've got here 50, that means that's going to drive down to release, lead down to 1. If I go down to C, you can see that C and D both go into B. So that means I've got a gross requirement. Those are going to be offset by their lead times. Those are going to drive down to uh, E and F, and you're going to offset for that. So that's how the, the uh, offsetting plan works. There is a tool in uh, Q&A called a firm plan order. It's this, one of the status codes. And it basically uh, takes planned orders in your system and fixes that planned order quantity in terms of date and uh, time. So if we look here, you can see that we've got, uh, there's our gross requirements across, across the top. We've got a scheduled receipt of 50. And so uh, MRP is going to calculate that we've got a net requirement or projected quantity at hand in negatives uh, 30. And so it's going to want to set back the lead time of part A of two periods. So it should tell us to release this. But maybe we don't want to do that. Maybe we want to have MRP only recognize what we call the time fence. And you'll find the time fence again in 1.4.7. So that it, MRP cannot uh, alter the order, nor does it allow an order to be placed into the time fence. So you've got a, a firm planned order here, and then uh, you'll see that the calculation falls out. Is to respond, respond to uh, material or capacity constraints. Scheduled receipts. Scheduled receipts are typically defined as paperwork released. Okay. They are to be considered available for use at the beginning of the time period. That's why I mentioned that I get upset at my planner or my buyers because they don't keep these dates up to uh, schnuff. And so my MRP doesn't work right because they don't uh, keep the orders uh, in sync. So this is basically paperwork released into the system. If you look at it in terms of work orders, that is the job packet that goes to the stock room, gets picked, and sent out to uh, the shop floor. So, MRP will not automatically reschedule scheduled receipts. It'll give you action messages to tell you that this is uh, violating the principle of exception, but MRP is not going to automatically uh, do that. So if you look at what is done by the computer in MRP, if you've got a scheduled receipt, a scheduled receipt is not going to explode because the assumption is you've already picked the parts, you already got it, it's already out at the uh, supplier, and it will not automatically reschedule that order. It may give you a recommendation to do it, but it won't automatically. A planned order will explode, that is what the bill of material does, it will automatically reschedule, depending on whether you use net change or regeneration. Regeneration basically wipes out all planned orders and replans everything. And if you use firm planned orders, they will explode, but you, the master schedule or the planner, have fixed those in time, so they will not automatically reschedule. However, again, you will get order action messages to, uh, to do that. MRP assumes a couple of things. Number one, you're going to do what it says. 
or a PDF that gives you an order action message, it assumes that you're going to take action and you're going to do what that is. You, and this is one of the biggest ones, it assumes you told them the truth in terms of your lead times, your on hand, your quantity, your planning elements, everything. Now, RP is simply a stupid computer. And so it will calculate based upon what you have told it. If MRP doesn't work, you're probably violating that truth. It's easier to expedite an order than to place a new order. Logic is that if you've already got a work order out in the shop floor, that it's probably easier to go out to the shop floor foreman and say, can I expedite that? Versus actually cutting a new purchase order, send it to the stock room, getting it picked, and putting that out on the shop floor. So we'll see what that uh, means in terms of what we call the rules of vessel alignment. If you told it it would take X days to complete a work order or place a purchase order, then it assumes it'll be accomplished in that time. So if you told it what that lead time is and it tells you to release this on period three out in the future and it's gonna take five days, it assumes that it's gonna be released on period three and it's gonna take five days to do it. <clears throat> If it tells you to expedite or delay a scheduled receipt, it assumes you were successful. So if it gives you an order action message that says go expedite that, the calculation of MRP is going to assume that you have been successful with that process. And that you've told it everything you know. And you just need to dump your heart and soul into the QED planning elements. Make MRP work. So, order policy modifiers. Twenty minutes. Uh, there's the order policy uh, modifiers. Uh, we've got discrete, which is lot for lot. That means if you got a requirement, it's going to plan an order. Got another requirement, it's going to plan an order. There's a fixed order quantity, which is uh, FOQ. Typically, we use EOQ to uh, calculate that. I'm not going to try and go through the uh, economic order quantity uh, calculation, but FOQ is a fixed order quantity. And so MRP is always going to calculate based on that uh, fixed order quantity. Then you've got period order quantity, and this is sometimes good for uh, purchase parts. If you are trying to capture the next 30 days of demand, put in a POQ and a period order quantity of 30. It will then go out and accumulate all the gross requirements through that 30-day period, and it will plan you an order in terms of that. Then you've also got uh, order quantity, modifiers, minimum quantity, maximum quantity, multiple quantities. Uh, minimum quantity, MRP is always going to order at least that. Maximum order quantities, MRP, QED's MRP simply gives you a message that uh, the system violated a uh, maximum order quantity. Or if you have a multiple order quantity, MRP will those, do those. So here's a picture of uh, item site planning uh, in 1.4.7, looks like uh, the same. Here's your order policy, order quantity, uh, order period, uh, max minimum order, that's where you set your uh, order policies. So if we look at a quick example, if I take you through the uh, calculations, you can see that I've got a minus 20. That's going to plan an order out there for the lot size of 25 for the arm assembly. Offset by one, come in, you've got five available, five is going to carry. Minus 35, you've got 35 of 50. That's going to come back in, it's going to go to uh, 15. And now that's going to carry out. You get another order quantity there in terms of that 25. And so you can see how that armorist assembly is going to plan those orders based on your lot size and your lead time offset. So those planned order releases, remember the planned order release becomes the grocery product <coughs> component. So if I Drive down there, you can see I've got 10, 10, minus 25, minus 15, 15, and now I've got a period order quantity of four periods. So I'm going to go out four periods, one, two, three, four, and I'm going to accumulate that period order quantity to that uh, POQ. 
So it's going to come in. My quantity in hand is going to go 75, 25, 25, 0. And now I can go back out. I don't have anything else in this particular example of anything out for period. So I'm just going to take that 50, and it's going to plan based on that POQ. So that's how order policy, and I find planners, I love them. I'm telling you now, because you have to understand what those, how those period order quantities, the lead times, the order minimums, multiples work within the MRP process. Uh, allocations. Allocations are basically uncashed stock receipts. So you've got a shop order or a customer order that's released, but the material is not issued. It's allocated. And uh, again, I won't go through the difference between a general allocation and a detail allocation, but as far as QED and MRP is concerned, it's got these quantities. So if you go to 3.18, you can see the allocated uh, quantities. Uh, safety stock. Safety stock is used to guard against variability in demand. So basically what it does is if you've got a safety stock value, instead of that net requirement being in equilibrium zero, it raises that equilibrium to whatever that safety stock level is. And if it goes below that safety stock, then you get the negative uh, net requirement and the planned order, uh, planned order that come out of it. Yield is at the uh, item level. And what this is is the ratio of the process uh, of the output to the relative input. So if I have uh, 100 going in and I've got a 90% yield, that means I get 90% out. So you can see that uh, here in the MRP detail, you can see that this scrap requirement, and this always annoys me because in the item master file, it's called yield percentage, but in the uh, MRP uh, 2314, it shows it as scrap requirement. But it basically uh, forces the system to plan more than it normally would if it had a zero yield. So if you put a yield factor in here, uh, be very cautious with how you do that. If we look at uh, the yield factor, I can just kind of walk through here. And you can see that with a yield factor of 10%, it's going to increase the quantities and my net orders or my planned order releases for that yield factor of 10 are going to re require me to have uh, back here 13 is period 1, 17 in uh, period uh, 4, and 111 and 17. If I look at the scrap factor, the scrap factor is maintained in 13.5 in the product structure parent component relationship. And so here I've got a scrap factor of 38%. That means that this component is going to be increased by 38% for every requirement that comes in uh, for the our KTO 591. And so here if I do the scrap factor, I use the same exact uh, processing, but you can see the difference between what the yield is versus how MRP is planning those uh, releases of a scrap factor versus the yield factor. Uh, order statuses. Each MRP order has a particular status. The first is planned, and it's always confusing because if you look at MRP DEET, the MRP planned order is maintained in the work order file. Drives me crazy, but that's how crazy it does it. And so these are the orders that are calculated every time you run that uh, MRP explosion. Firm planned orders, if you put an F on the order status, you've got a firm planned order, locks it in in terms of quantity and date, but still explodes through that product structure. A released order, is paperwork generated instead of receipts already out the floor, people are working on it. Once the release process has been completed and you've done your 1611, your work order receipt uh, into inventory, it's going to go to a closed status if you do 1621, which is work order counting closed. That's going to be a C status, and then you can delete those work orders if you need to. We haven't done that in uh, 10 years. So, all right. 
or what are tables that get that bigger? So how do you uh, release planned orders? Well, this is a different step. You check order actions in MRP, in the MRP order action uh, report. You check the availability of components to make sure that it's going to be uh, clean. You don't want to cut the work order unless the parts are available and you can actually get it on the shop floor. You create the shop plaque packet or the uh, purchase requisition, uh, and that can be a big process. Depends if you need prints or other uh, QC documents or whatever. Then you allocate components in 1613.1, work order bill maintenance, and then you finally uh, schedule that receipt in uh, the 16.6, work order release and print. So that's how you go back about uh, planning it. Scheduled receipts basically are paper release. So here's the planned order, uh, work order approval. You can go in and you can uh, agree or disagree with uh, QED and uh, tell it you want to uh, release that work order. This generates a firm planned order in MRP. Uh, this is uh, 2311, the planned purchase order uh, process. So you've got your requisitions item numbers and the quantities that you want to uh, turn into those scheduled receipts for uh, MRP. Rescheduling. There's two things that MRP basically does. It tells you what you need to release, those planned orders, but it also tells you that it, you're violating that principle of exception, which one of these don't fall into uh, concordance with your plan. So MRP will give you rescheduling uh, methods. You will either reschedule in or reschedule out or planners ever pay any attention to this. Cancel the work orders. I don't see planners usually do that. Uh, you can also dampen MRP process. We created a uh, an MRP browse that uh, only allows us to look at uh, reschedule messages within a particular, particular uh, time horizon. But here's uh, rescheduling, and it calls the rules of misalignment. Okay, So if I've got my MRP plan across the horizon, you can see that my uh, bill material is going to drive down from the 50. Now I've got uh, 50 on hand. Okay, <coughs> So my uh, projected or my projected quantity on the hand is 100. Now I've got uh, 50. Now I've got a net requirement in that second period, but I've already got a scheduled receipt in the third period. So MRP assumes it's easier to expedite than to place a new one. So it's going to give you a message to expedite that 200 <coughs> period uh, three into period two. MRP assumes that. If it tells you to do something, you're going to be successful. So it assumes that that 200 is now coming in in period two. The 150 goes and satisfies the 100 with 50 left over. And now I've got 50 at the end of period five, but I've also got a schedule receipt of 50 in that period uh, six. So if an open order is scheduled for a period in which the gross requirement is equal to or less than, the projected quantity on hand, it says, push it out. So it's going to tell you to de-expedite that order. And then if you uh, go ahead and do that, again, assuming you're going to do what it says, then you've got this 50. You don't need that 50 at all. So it's going to give you a cancel message on that. So those are what are called the rules of misalignment. Uh, action messages, you should become familiar with all of the action messages that uh, are generated by QED. Each one of them has a specific uh, meaning and function within the MRP explosion. Uh, after receipt work for bills of material, Ollie White would say 100% everything. 100% cycle count, 100% bill of material, 100% purchase order, work order due dates, and planning data. So if your MRP is not working, don't go yell at the system. Go make MRP do that. So it requires, as I said, it requires a high degree of knowledge, accuracy, and discipline 
to make it work. Uh, item planning is where you're going to do all of your planning maintenance. Here you've got uh, master schedule. That simply says this is a master schedule item. And you can use 23.16 to create master schedule work orders. Or uh, if you just want MRP to plan, you've got to have that uh, plan to order checkbox. We talked about the time fences. Uh, MRP required, if that is checked, it means that MRP has a series of parameters defined in the screens that said if the system on hand changed, lead time changed, order policy changed, MRP needs to regenerate. So if that is checked, yes, you need to go run 23.2 or 23.4. Well, the other one, MRP required, not planned order. Uh, MRP required, yeah. Planned order simply says MRP is going to run. Uh, here you've got your order policies, fixed order, uh, lot for lot, period order quantity. Fixed order quantity is equal to uh, whatever your EOQ is or whatever your fixed order quantity is. Uh, be cautious with this. If it's blank, MRP doesn't plan it. So you to make sure you've uh, looked at that. Then you've got your order period here. So if this is POQ, this could be an order quantity, 30, 60, whatever you want. Here's where you input your uh, safety stock. If you don't want this particular item planned by MRP, uncheck that and put in a reorder point. And then you can use the reorder point uh, reports that come out of acuity. Uh, buyer planners, suppliers, uh, purchase uh, manufacturer lead or, uh, status. Here's your lead times in terms of uh, manufacturing or purchasing. This is a cumulative lead time if you run your cumulative lead time report. That will update this value here. Here you've got your uh, min, max, and order quantity. Uh, if you're going to use operation-based yield to calculate uh, MRP, which means that you're going to go into your router and set uh, yield factors at each operation, you have to check that to, uh, to make that accurate. So at uh, in one to to seven, this is uh, product structure maintenance. Here's your parent component relationship. This is your uh, start and uh, your end effectivity date. Your quantity per. Here's that scrap factor we looked at. And if you have a lead time offset in this particular case, if this component, if you're making cabinets and you don't need the doors for the cabinet until the absolute last operation, don't issue them with first operation. Put the uh, lead time offset for that. Uh, this is formulas. Anybody use formulas? We do. Yeah. This is formulas. So this is uh, the parent component relationship here. You have the uh, quantity type, which is either batch uh, percentage or if it's blank, it's the same as uh, product structure. And then you've got structure type. And if you've got documents, that kind of thing, you can uh, put those in. Then uh, transaction by items. I'm sure Ben knows this by heart because every one of those is going to affect MRP. So you get inaccurate transactions, you need to go in and figure out what they are, what all these do. Uh, an issue work order takes it out of quantity on hand and puts it into the whip. Uh, appeal receipt. So you need to understand what all those uh, transactions are. There's 23 different transactions that affect quantity on hand. So I'm sure Ben knows all of those by heart. Okay, uh, cycle down process. I'm going to talk about that. Here's the three types of explosions: the net change, regeneration, and selective. We run net change nightly. We run uh, regen uh, every weekend, and the planners will hit 23 to three five times a day, just depending on what they need. Okay, uh, low level code. Uh, if you're changing your bills of material on a regular basis, your formulas, you probably would need to run this uh, local, local code update because this affects where in that process it's going to uh, do its uh, low level calculations. Then calendars, how many have got their calendars set? Go do your calendar sets. Yeah. MRP doesn't work well if you don't have that set. Holidays. Okay, uh, here's some utilities that uh, MRP can use. Uh, rebuild MRP deep table, that's where all the transactions 
or what are action messages that are uh, held. Uh, delete MRPD with no detail. That's one of the things I love about QED is it gives you all these uh, utilities to go in and fix problems that probably not going to do. MRP control uh, sets your uh, MRP horizon. What's your MRP horizon? CMLD, Cumulative Manufacturing Lead Time. Uh, are you going to use uh, seven days? Oops, excuse me. Uh, are you going to use uh, a seven day uh, order release hyzen? In other words, seven days out in the future, everything that hits pine loader release, you're going to get a message for it. And then limits of MRP. MRP is capacity insensitive. In other words, it ignores critical resources. That's why we do capacity requirements planning, resource requirements, rough cut capacity, and CRP. It's overly demand sensitive. So if you change one thing, it can, if you change uh, water policy or a quantity on hand of a parent item, and that parent item has got 400 components, you're going to get 400 order action messages. And, yeah, there you go. Benefits, multiple benefits. If you use material requirement planning, the way it's designed makes planners, warehouse, purchasing, everybody's life easier. 